and out. So I'm going to, uh, before we uh, start, I'm going to do the obligatory marketing section of the panel. Uh, this year, it's uh, Comixology's 10-year anniversary. Uh, Woo! We're uh, hosting the panel since uh, one of these shows is an exclusive uh, Comixology uh, release, and I'll talk about that more later. Uh, if you want to join Team Comics, we have an activation in the... Uh, in Artist Alley, where you can get your photo uh, taken with uh, some of your favorite creators. And uh, that's in Hall 1E, down the hallway. And uh, for those of you that love to read comics, I don't know if you know, that we have this thing called Comicsology Limited. You can read over 10,000 comic books uh, 30 days for free, and then it's $5.99 a month. And uh, that's important because it, it uh, ties in with Marley's Ghost, I promise. Marley's Ghost is part of the uh, Comicsology Originals line of uh, line of content, exclusive content that we're doing, uh, which debuts on uh, Comicsology Limited. Uh, so uh, this past year, we've uh, worked with uh, Boom Studios and done uh, an Adventure Time, Martially Spectacular. We've uh, uh, brought Battle Angel Alita, a uh, noted manga, uh, back into circulation out of being, after being out of print for uh, ten years. Uh, we uh, collaborated with Valiant on a uh, superhero series where we took the Valiant characters and put them in high school. And then we also have done an ongoing collaboration with Marvel uh, for some uh, great for new readers books, uh, sort of tied into some of their key uh, movie and film TV releases, uh, Iron Fist and Thor vs. Hulk. And uh, this past week, uh, we announced a noted, noted uh, African American science fiction writer on uh, Black Panther, which is getting a, a lot of people excited, and you're like, this is a Harvey Kurtzman panel, why are you talking about this? Because Marley's Ghost is one of the uh, Comicsology originals coming out this year. So welcome to the panel. And our panels are, ba -ba -ba. to my farthest right is Dennis Kitchen. Cartoonist, publisher, gadfly, man about town. Next to him is John Lind, and uh, John and not only is John a multi-hyphenate, award-winning designer, book packager, uh, part-time agent, part-time man about town also, but uh, Kitchen Lind Associates uh, packaged the uh, Marley's Ghost book, and then to uh, to John's left is uh, Calvin Reed. I'm going to try not to mess this up. Senior editor at Publishers Senior News Editor. Senior News Editor at Publishers Weekly. And then uh, to his left is Josh O'Neill. Two L's in O'Neill, and uh, and that's him uh, last week in Cairo. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Josh was doing a uh, outreach for uh, comic book artists in Egypt last week, uh, which is super cool. And to his left is Shannon Wheeler, New Yorker cartoonist. Also did a little comic book called Too Much Coffee Man. And then to his left is the, the uh, star talent, debut talent, uh, Gideon Kendall, who uh, Interiors of uh, of Marley's Ghost in uh, in a little bit. So uh, Kurtzman's birthday was uh, October third, and uh, it's been about twenty five years since he passed. And uh, uh, John or Dennis, do you guys mind just speaking to uh, Kurtzman's uh, legacy as we you know as we get into this? Well. Probably you know who Harvey is if you came here, but uh, he's most famous for Brady Mad Magazine, but before that he had Frontline Combat and Two-Fisted Tales at EC, which were groundbreaking, realistic war stories that told it as it was, not the typical jingoistic stories. Before that he worked for Stan Lee doing a thing called Hey Look, where he honed his comedic skills. 
And then later in his career, he is best known for <coughs> magazines like uh, Humbug and Trump and then Little Annie Fanny for Playboy. But early into his tenure, should I talk about the origins of Marley now? Or? Oh, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get to that. Yep. Okay. So that's, that's just a quick overview. Great. And then uh, we have this beautiful piece of Times Square that, uh, that Harvey did. And uh, putting that up, uh, John, do you want to speak to the uh, Harvey Awards coming to, uh, to New York this year? Yeah, actually. The, um, so the Harvey Awards are officially moving to New York in 2018 uh, with the full awards show and, and a uh, reception afterward for professionals. And this year there's a, a reception. Um, what is the ballroom that it's at? It's in the Hudson, Hudson Annex. The Hudson Annex, thank you. And um, it's kind of the kickoff. Uh, we're inducting Darwin Cook into the uh, Harvey Awards Hall of Fame. And um, it should be good. I add things to it. <laughs> and feeding Hiramashima, <laughs> thank you. a noted mangaka who's uh, most well known for the uh, multi million volume seller fairy tale from Kadok. So one of the things that uh, Kurtzman uh, worked on but never completed was uh, an adaption of the Christmas Carol. And, uh, and he did all these thumbnails. And uh, Dennis and John, can you uh, have, I have three slides of thumbnails. Can you just talk about the background at this point? Well, for context, it's important to know the year he did this. In 1954, he was already a couple of years into MAD, which was really taking off. And he still found time to create what today we call a graphic novel. But in 1954, of course, there was no even concept of a book size comic book. So uh, he was a big fan of Dickens, and uh, one of his dreams was to adapt this. These uh, thumbnails are the way he worked on every comic. EC, uh, Little Annie Fanny, everything. He started with thumbnails, then he'd work up to uh, tighter pencils. And so these are remarkable in the sense that they're his very first thought as he's planning out his page. And if you look at these very rudimentary small drawings next to the finished pages, they're surprisingly close. He, he knew almost instantly what the composition of the page should be. It's one of the brilliant things about him. There's probably nobody better in terms of composing a comics page. There isn't much to add. The, um, on these, he didn't do the, the full uh, tracing paper roughs. Usually there's a kind of a process so they didn't survive. Right, right. And then there are a couple of finished pages that he did, and, uh, and then he got Jack Davis to finish. And here's the first page of each. Right. Something actually that I always think about when I see the Jack Davis finishes and, and anything that Harvey worked on with, uh, with other artists is when we were doing the Art of Harvey Kurtzman book, um, one of the things that we didn't end up putting in there but we had uh, access to was uh, his US passports. And on them, he listed his profession as writer. And I, I always think that it was never artist or writer artist or illustrator or anything like that. And I think there probably was a, a would you say, the lack of self-confidence in his own style to some degree, especially when comparing it with somebody like Jack Davis, you know, who has that, that very certain clean line style and Elder, obviously, the same way. Um, Harvey's what's, uh, what I would say was an artist's artist. Other artists look at his work and they think it's magnificent, but Harvey always felt uh, the public never really appreciated his own art, so he always felt he had to collaborate with someone he called Slicker, and Jack Davis was slick. Harvey's, if you look on the left, it's very expressionistic and bold, um, but it's not probably a commercial style. He knew that. But we think it's amazing. And so in uh, late 2015, when we uh, decided to uh, go forward with the Comicsology Originals plan, uh, Dennis and I were talking about uh, all these uh, thumbnails that uh, Kurtzman had, uh, had left behind. 
and have never completed. And uh, and so, Dennis, John, can you guys speak to uh, you know putting Josh and Shannon and Gideon together for the to complete the posthumous work or the work posthumously? Well, we said what living creators could fit into Harvey Kurtzman's shoes. And immediately, Josh O'Neill and Gideon Kendall came to mind. No, sarcasm aside. <laughs> we, we, we do love these guys. They're very talented. And um, they did, I think, an incredible job of interpreting this and adding their own strengths to it. Um, I. I knew Harvey well, and he was a stickler and a very critical guy, but I think he would have loved this, and that's the highest compliment I've been given. Do you have any of Gideon's roughs? Do you have another? Oh, oh, yeah. Can you switch to one? I, yeah, I was going to say, Gideon. I got, a, I got a whole thing on yeah. it. Right, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm spacing out on My, um, the did, you just, was, did you just fly in from the UK? I did, I did, and I'm showing it. The um, the thing I was going to say with Gideon, too, is he did a couple tests, and I think from pretty much the first one or two that Josh circulated around to, uh, to everybody, you know, it was kind of jaw-dropping how, how he was able to take a little bit of Kurtzman style, blend it with his own, and make it, you know, he already has a little Jack Davis in him, so it, it really uh, was a, a perfect... Uh, Ability to do something that didn't feel like he was aping it, but felt like he was extending it, um, you know, and really doing a, a justice to that that work. So, and so we debuted uh, the uh, Comics All Originals did a, a pre-announce of the book in the New York Times uh, in uh, October, I think, of 2016, and uh, we debuted the uh, cover and uh, the price point of 9.99. And uh, we did not give you a release date, uh, but uh, I'll let you guys know. Today, the book is coming out on the 8th of uh, November. Uh, the price point is going to be uh, at a special discount of $2.99. And uh, if you have a subscription to Comixology Unlimited or a 30-day trial, you'll be able to read it for free. And if you are on Kindle Unlimited, you'll also be able to read it for free. So. Uh, we're, uh, we're looking forward to getting a, a, a wide uh, reception. And that is Gideon Kendall's brand new cover debuting here at the panel. That you just finished yesterday? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Chip, use the new cover. <laughs> and so, uh, so why, don't we, uh, why don't we look at some pages revealed for the first time. We go. So there's chapter one, the first page, which uh, which I believe we had the uh, is similar to the first pages that we've had of Jack Davis and Kurtzman, and then one of uh, Gideon's uh, roughs. And uh, here's some other pages. I think that's uh, page two and three, and then a page from the middle of the book. It's beautiful stuff. Can I ask Gideon? Can you, can you talk a little about your drawing process? Uh, sure. Well, you know, there was sort of two different kinds of uh, drawing processes in this book. There was the pages that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, I didn't know you were going to show that one. That was the central part of the drawing process. That's, that's, my, friend, that's my friend Lucas wearing a, wearing a custom-made uh, Victorian, uh, Victorian-style nightgown. Uh, I, it, was, it was hard to find one to fit a guy who was six foot four, so I ended up hiring a seamstress to, to make one. And uh, it really, it was, it was worth every penny because I don't know if you have the, the first sketch I did of him, which is a total Jack Davis ripoff. Um, I had no idea how to draw the nightgown, like the, the folds. And, and throughout the story, I mean, Scrooge does all this acting, you know, he's on the ground, he's running, he's falling down, he's begging for his life. And I was like, I cannot draw this nightgown just out of my head accurately. So I had the nightgown made and I had a lot of fun with my friend embarrassing him. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, and then on the left is the stack of books that I referenced slash ripped off slash was inspired by, uh, you know, for various aspects of the book. Um, 
And then, uh, you know, as far as doing the drawings, you know, there was two really distinct phases. There was the, there was the, the section of the book that Kurtzman had sketched out, and uh, that only lasted, well, really, for a total of about 50 pages is what he sketched out, and uh, really by page, somewhere in the 30s, the sketches really, really got simple to the point where by around page 50, he was just drawing rectangles and writing a word <laughs> in it. So, uh, you know, as the book went on, there was less and less to go from uh, as far as what Kurtzman did. And that was both good and bad, you know. And, and Kurtzman's stuff was amazing and super helpful, but it was also really intimidating working from his stuff. And so in a way, once I got beyond that, uh, and once uh, Josh and I, you know, started figuring out how we were going to tell the rest of the story, um, you know, in a way it was freer, you know, but certainly that first 30 to 40 pages, you know, really set the foundation for, like, how we were going to proceed and try to, you know, to, as best we could, you know, guess at what would have made Kurtzman happy. And Josh, what... You, you took lead on breaking down the, uh, the Christmas Carol. And uh, so can you talk about that and the process and well, matching it to the thumbnails? And yeah, it was, re it was a really interesting process because sort of a unique editorial thing because you have these two texts. You have the Christmas Carol, the, the book, and you have these, these beautiful roughs that are incomplete, that like Gideon said, go less than halfway through the book, and some of them are, are really super rough. You would leave whole pages blank sometimes. Um, so it was uh, this sort of interesting challenge of going, uh, okay, how much are you beholden to these different visions? You have, you have the vision of Dickens, you have the vision of Kurtzman, and then you have Gideon and myself as like the people on the ground trying to negotiate between the two and figure out what our voice in telling this story is. Uh, so it was, it was really interesting trying to figure out I exactly how to thread that needle and uh, how, how close to Hugh to exactly what Kurtzman was doing and how much to try to abide by the spirit of what he was doing. I mean, the roughs, despite being super rough, are just filled with the sort of uh, choreographic music that Kurtzman's comics uh, always engender. Um, and there's a really, I mean, there's the eight finished pages that he did, so you get the sense of what he wanted the comic to look like, but there's just like a powerful narrative voice that comes through in those roughs. So uh, Gideon and I worked very closely together, sort of uh, working it was with, a lot of fun. it was great. Yeah. We just kind of like camped out in Gideon's studio and like went through the whole book, like doing thumbnails of every panel one by one and looking at Kurtzman's roughs and going, okay, what's, what's he going for here? How does this fit into the rest of the story? Um, and then as we no longer had roughs to go off, um, figuring out how to kind of continue the pacing and tone of that storytelling. Um, so it was interesting. It just felt like we were sort of in conversation with these, I mean, Dickens and Kurtzman are two of my favorite storytellers that have ever existed in all of human history. So it was very <laughs> neat to sort of like get to posthumously collaborate with both of them in this weird way and kind of uh, act almost like as a go-between between them. Um, but it was, yeah, it was fun. It was, it was unique. I can't imagine another project that would be similar to what, what we did here. If I could add one, one other thing that uh, uh, was a big factor for me was uh, all the various movies of A Christmas Carol, which I started watching and taking screenshots of for reference. But what happened, the more I watched the movies and kind of absorbed them and realized how they're all so different, and no one really tells Dickens' story exactly the way he told it. And there, there are, there's so many different choices that were made in the movies. And as we were trying to decipher the rest of the book and figure out a way to, you know, simplify it a bit, streamline it a bit, you know, the movies kind of gave us permission to be like, well, okay, we can play with this a little bit too. And realize that just as when they were making a movie of it, they were like, okay, this isn't the book. We need to make a successful movie. We're, uh, you know, a movie story that works. We did the same thing. We were like, we need to make a comic book story that works. And so making those kind of adjustments and changes was uh, was another challenging and fun part of it. Right. And there's, 
there's some stuff in the book that sort of just doesn't work as well visually, and you notice it gets changed consistently in almost every movie. But on the other hand, I also felt like part of Kurtzman's vision for it was that he wanted to do a really faithful adaptation. Um, and so uh, we were sort of... We didn't really. <laughs> yeah, we sort of steered somewhat, somewhat away from that, but tried to maintain uh, yeah. like some of, the, some of what, what he was going for. Well, there are also parts that um, get left out of most of the movies for budget reasons that, that we could do yeah. that are in the original text. Like when the Ghost of Christmas Present takes him like to a mining camp and then takes him out across the ocean, like that's perfect for comics. And so we got to do those parts. And uh, those are like some of the most fun parts. Yeah, those are some of my favorite parts yeah. of the book. Yeah. And then Josh, can you speak to like what Shannon did on the book and, and your collaboration with him and and, uh, and how that works? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Shannon's main role was to tell us to shut up. <laughs> because like, it. It, again, that was another thing that was actually tricky in terms of translating Kurtzman's vision because I think his initial vision for the book was to include a lot of, uh, if you look at his early roughs, like, he had a very caption-driven kind of approach where there was a lot of Dickens text in there. But it was just so old-fashioned and kind of read as, as leaden today, I think. Um, but I also, I love Dickens so much, so there's, you're reading the book and figuring out what you can plug into the story, and you get yeah. addicted to the language sometimes. Yeah, it's go it's just things. so, there are these phrases that you're like, oh, it's not really necessary for the storytelling, but it's so pretty, like you gotta put it in there, and Shannon feel like, get it out, drop it. So when it, when it repeats, you have, a, you have an image, you're letting the, the visuals are telling the story, and you don't want it to be, just reiterate the words, and so, that's where I was like, this needs to be cut. You don't say that he's walking down the stairs and show him walking down the yeah. stairs. It's like, but that's something that's really shifted as we've gotten better at graphic storytelling, I think, that where I think Kurtzman was really dedicated to the, to the text. But it was such an unusual project that he was doing, too. I think that he was probably a little bit intimidated himself. I yeah. Think, I think that he also, you know, he didn't, he didn't finish it. He didn't. I, I think we talked a lot about like wondering what he would have done if he had kept going. Like at a certain point, right. would he have been like, uh, you know what? I don't need all these words. Definitely, or, he definitely would. Have you know, because I think also, <laughs> yeah, I, I think also that you know the sketches that he did, he sketched out one of the most fun parts of the book. You know, yeah. like the, the the ghost stuff. You know, he he wanted it to be a ghost story, but then where his drawings start kind of drifting away is like when it starts to turn into like cocktail parties and you know this stuff really and, dresses and yeah <laughs> like just like drawing a lot of talking heads and stuff and you know that stuff yeah isn't quite a lot fun to draw there's there's one page where the the, the rough is just it just says they all come in <laughs> yeah, every panel. It's broken up into panels, but no drawings. They just say in, in each panel. <laughs> it's like he didn't want to draw this any more than Gideon wants to draw it. <laughs> but one of the most flabbergasting things that Gideon was able to do was keep the costumes consistent for all of these Christmas party scenes oh, with geez. all of these women with like a complicated hairdo and a ribbon and earrings and a bow and a floofy thing and like page after page of them dancing and I made talking. It myself. And, like, <laughs> but they, I mean, as an editor, I'm like going through trying to find incons because I'm like, there's no way this is this is consistent all the way through, but it's like, it's like totally consistent. It's amazing. Well, it was, so, yeah, there's some things. <laughs> it was so fun, like from a thousand miles away, to like watch you guys, you know, from bird's eye view, like collaborate and jam. And, you know, I think it's such a monumental task to take someone's thumbnails that they did 60 years ago, right. and someone like Kurtzman, who's so, you know, uh, it, it's just such a, a legend in our industry. Yeah, it was and, intimidating and totally intimidating, and, and put, you know. The three of you, which you know, each one of you have uh, such different perspectives, and I, I, I thought it was uh, it was fascinating to, to watch, like what Gideon was bringing, what you were bringing, you know, Shannon's, you know, it was Taking great. Out. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great.
<laughs> yeah, it was such vital editorial guidance. <laughs> like, it's easy to get drunk on Dickens' words. <laughs> you need so someone to sober you up. How did you keep it consistently drunk? Did you have little models of each hat, or uh, you know, I kept like, too. I was like, how did you know? this is crazy. I just, I kept um, a uh, what is the program bridge? You know. Uh, part of Photoshop, or just basically every time I design a character, I'd make sure I had an image of that character in there, and for you know a section for each chapter. And it's like, okay, this character is wearing this costume in this chapter, and you know, I, I still made lots of mistakes, and I, I did the whole thing digitally, and thank God for that because when it was time to go back and go through, I could change that guy's bow tie, you know, pretty easily <laughs> in all the pictures when I needed to, you know, or whatever things like that. Yeah, just a question to, to, to make sure I'm clear. Was was there some kind of script as well? No. Yeah, that's just what I'm. Yeah, I'm sort of marveling at that yes. as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had, you know, in the. Uh, so you had to really go to the text. Yeah. Yeah. We we read. We you know yeah. we went over the text and we tried to make mm -hmm. uh, so just like these little indica yeah. indications. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you know match that with the Dickens text and make sort of like hit the beats, you yeah, know, of, yeah. of like where the page break should be and what needed to happen on each page. And yeah, yeah. It was actually really fun, it was, yeah. you know, that was a really fun part. Yeah, it was like, great. Like two ghost stories, I mean, you guys are talking to a ghost right. at the same time. No, it's so true, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep, keep in mind, was there, were, there were larger, <laughs> larger, tighter pencils that Harvey always did, but they didn't survive, uh, and those really. would have had the text broken down. Uh, oh, but we know he did you, those for this project? Well, if you look in, uh, in our Art of Harvey Kurtzman book, there are examples from the war stories where seven of these uh, tissue overlays survive, and they're beautiful too. But he would give them to Wally Wood and Jack Davis and Will Elder, and when they were done, they'd throw them away, because oh. in those days, there was no Comic-Con you could sell them at. <laughs> it was just a, a, a part, of, part of the production. They didn't yeah. take all that seriously. So that's why only seven out of however many stories survived. But do we know he ever got that far of drawing, a, drawing those? He must have for the, for the seven or eight pages that pages, survived, yeah, plus right. what Jack Davis did. Right. So. And Jack would have just thrown in the wastebasket. But and then of course there are these eight finished finished pages that we have, so we could at least get the sense of how he was he was trying to approach the storytelling from a text perspective, and then do something a little different. Now, what if I may ask also, uh, Dennis? But what's the, the full history? I mean, this was rejected right over and over again by Harvey. Took it to this stage of the eight or nine pages, and uh, he remember he's got a full time job mm -hmm. with Matt. He made an appointment, or tried to, with an editor at Simon & Schuster. And again, remember, this is 1954. And uh, he sent a letter, that's why we know the exact date and details, and uh, tried to describe in the letter what he was doing. And the woman at Simon & Schuster clearly didn't think this was worth her time. And she said, well, you can see my assistant. So there was a young man, Harvey, finally got to see, and we know his name, it was Mr. Manjo. He was probably in his early 20s, an editorial assistant, and there's no record of that conversation other than uh, Harvey was rejected by a young man. And I've often thought, um, had he been a mad reader or a comic fan, the whole course of graphic novel history might have been changed. But instead, um, it was rejected. There's no record of Harvey taking it anywhere else until 1962, for some reason, he approached the Saturday Evening Post with it, because he had been doing contributions to them. They didn't know what to do with it either, and at that point he just forgot it. Uh, and thankfully he saved all these, but as he said later in an interview, uh, he didn't know how to sell it. In those days, no literary agent would have handled a cartoonist like Harvey, and he was not a salesman himself. Uh, he was a creator. So that's the sad part of it. But at least it survived, and finally, these guys get to be Harvey's last collaborators. <laughs> well, should we open it up for questions to the audience? Anybody have any questions? 
Yeah, I'm curious. The title Marley's Ghost suggests a different take, a different approach to the story. And I'm wondering, from what you saw, how does this take differ? I mean, I'm hearing you say it kind of, it's a little contradictory because you're saying he was, he was a story, but it looks like he came from a different lens. So how did that work? How was it different? Yeah, we, we talked a lot about that question because we don't know for sure. We can't say why he changed the name. But our, our thinking, at least from, uh, from looking at the eight finished pages and looking at the title, is that I, I think a lot of what drew him to uh, Christmas Carol is sort of the, the ghost story aspect of it. Whereas, uh, you know, a lot, I mean, Christmas Carol is probably one of the most adapted stories in the English language in all kinds of different formats and illustration and film cartoons. Uh, but generally, I, I feel like the sort of the creepiness of it is not, not really what's highlighted. And uh, at least in the, in the pages he drew, you get that the sense, the sense that's kind of what excited him. And when you see that he named it Marley's Ghost, um, I think that's, and so we tried to sort of keep that with us as, as this idea. We, we made it a little darker and, yeah. and moodier and more, more supernatural. Yeah. yeah, and the in the fourth chapter where the ghost of Christmas future takes him to sort of the, the, the nightmare future where he's dead and forgotten, uh, we, we really tried to make it scary. We tried to, we tried, we made it very sort of hallucinogenic and put him in, this, in a sort of nightmare world um, in a way that I had not seen another Christmas Carol adaptation. Uh, really do so. So, like I said, we're sort of guessing at exactly what what Kurtzman was going for with that title. It's very interesting that, that the title focused specifically on Marley. Um, but so that's how we that's how we interpret it. So like, was there an expansion of Marley's story, the story of Jacob Marley? We did try to try to weave Marley in uh, throughout a little bit a little bit more. Than, and we brought him back at the end. Yeah, but, yeah, which which, <laughs> which most adaptations don't do. Because I mean. Marley's usually a pretty small character. He kind of sets off the story and then sort of disappears and is never really mentioned again. Uh, I, I, I was just saying, but in the context of 1954 and Harvey being at EC, Harvey hated the horror stories that Gaines and Feldstein were cranking out. He hated them. And uh, I think this was his way of dealing with the supernatural in a classier way than he thought EC was. Any other questions? You know, actually, I have a question. <laughs> Maybe for Dennis or for any of you, really. I mean, it's, the, the, his thumbnails and, and laying out the pages is kind of legendary. And his demand that, that artists really use them almost completely, as I understand and read. But I'm curious, um, I mean, obviously, in those days, people needed to work and they were going to do what they were told. But I'm curious, did the artists fight back against this? Did they? Oh, sorry. And how close? Did it, um, did it have to be really rigidly followed? What was interesting to me was I remember an interview with George Evans years ago in one of the fanzines, and he talked about how he would argue incessantly with Harvey and fight him. And um, only some years after that that I discovered these surviving uh, tight pencils that Harvey gave the artist, and two of them were stories George Evans did. And I compared them to the published story and it was exactly as Harvey demanded he do it. So he didn't he didn't like to be told how to do it, but there was respect for Harvey, and they did it. One other example, Adele, Harvey's uh, widow, told me that she remembered early in their marriage when uh, Harvey was collaborating with Wally Wood, among others, and she said Wally would come to their house and very politely say, hello, Adele, and go into a room with Harvey closed the door and she would hear loud yelling. <laughs> and finally the yelling would subside, the door would open, and he'd very politely say, Good night, Adele. <laughs> well, that's I what's actually, so extraordinary because some of the, 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 the creators that work with, these are some of the most iconic names right. in cartooning. Right. I mean, they've got a kind of a rep, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked that same, we did a uh, panel last year with Arnold Roth and Al Jaffe. And, and I, when we were sitting around before the, the panel, I, I asked that of, um, I asked Al about it, and, uh, and he said, well, I would do cartoons, and I would hand them in, and Harvey would, you know, draw all over them, and have me change a bunch of things, and then hand it back, and he said he was almost, almost always right, and he said, you know, but it was hours and hours of changes and things like that. 
And Arnold Roth just kind of went, huh, that's funny. If, if he did anything to mine, I would just tell him then don't print it, and I'd take it back. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a completely different, you know, but... Interesting. Yeah, so... Well, we had the advantage of Harvey being dead. <laughs> <laughs> so it limits your ability to exercise editorial control. <laughs> And Dennis and John, oh, there's a question. Oh, no, you were on the camera. He's looking at the camera. No, no. So, oh, go ahead. Are there any other Kirkman projects that aren't finished that uh, uses? Harvey's ghost. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question was uh, referring to Kurtzman, any yeah, unfinished? Kurtzman. Yeah, No, I would say this was the only one unrealized of substance. Uh, Anything else would have been not as documented as this. Yeah, if it wasn't for the existence of those of those 50 pages of Ross, or I think it was 60 pages of Ross, this project would have been a, sort of half-assed in some way. But the fact that he told so much of the story in, in his own voice gave us a lot to work off of. And actually, one other thing: if the correspondence hadn't survived with Simon and Schuster, we'd have had no clue this was as early as 1954. We all would have presumed it was certainly post EC or who knows. Would have been tough to date. But it's really pretty remarkable that uh, he thought he could pull this off in that prehistoric era of comics. So, Gideon, how, uh, how scared to excited? What was the <coughs> in finishing someone like Kurtzman's work for you? Uh, it was way more scared. It, especially at first, um, I mean, I uh, this was a huge opportunity and honor for me. I mean, I you know, I I made comics when I was a kid, and then I stopped for like 20 years, and so to have an opportunity to work on something like this was completely intimidating. I mean, and exciting too. But yeah, it was it was really terrifying, <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, I think that you know once we got into a rhythm, and again once we were able to like, move into the parts of the book beyond his sketches, you know because we you know we sketched the whole thing out first, and so <clears throat> once we were through with all the sketches, then to be able to like take stock of how we told the story, and then go back and start you know doing the pencils and everything, and try to find some way to unify everything, like then it just became about you know making the thing, and uh, I stopped being quite so terrified. But yeah, as, as you move along, like, the, the preciousness can't last for the entire project, yeah. because you have to make a book at some point. You right. can't be just, like, thinking about the legacy of a person the entire time. Like, right. At a certain point, you have to get down to how do we make a good comic that, that, does, that carries forward the vision of Kurtzman, but is, is also something that, that's, a, that's a vision of, of, of us who are on the ground making it. Yeah, and, um, we, were just, and we started having fun, too. That was, yeah. that was uh, you know, working with Josh at the at the uh, the thumbnailing stage was just super fun. Yeah, yeah. we had a we had a ball. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, as you you just keep moving forward, and at a certain point, it's just what you're doing every day, and uh, you can't you can't be scared the whole time. <laughs> like, you just run out of fear. I tried. I tried. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, uh, I'm a Comixology Unlimited subscriber, so great, this is wonderful. But do you guys, are there any plans to do, um, maybe in a, with a cooperation with somebody else, or a print version of this at any point? TBD. <laughs> <laughs> when will it be D? <laughs> TB. <laughs> Can I quote you on that? As a <laughs> member of the meeting? <laughs> TV. Quote, TV. Unquote. TV or not TV. Oh, no, no, no. That is the question. Yeah, I you know, I think the thing that I, I really what I really enjoy about with getting I think you delivered the final product this a couple of days ago, and I think what I enjoy most about it is is that it, uh, it's so accessible, and I think you know, and, and and the project didn't let the weight of the of it being a posthumous completion 
that uh, you know didn't uh, you know it, it, it. I think it's it's more respectful to Kurtzman's legacy because it's so accessible and it's, it reads so well and it's uh, you know I think I think it will receive uh, a wide audience and I, I'm just really excited to to get to that point in uh, 30 days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I come from a children's book uh, background, and it's really awesome to not have to wait like a year and a half <laughs> for the book to be out. Yeah. Go ahead. It sounds like there's a lot of fun to do this. Is there any frustrating points that work with this work? Though? We don't talk about those. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Senior Director of Communication, Comicsology, also, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's not in the talking points, Gideon, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were elements of storytelling that were just really hard and, and, and frustrating. Like, uh, parts of, uh, especially once we were beyond the parts that were roughed out by, by Kurtzman, there's, you know, it's a, it's a novel. It's not written for, for a visual, visual format. And there were things that we wanted to make sure to get across in the story that could not be directly translated from like a text to a visual format. So there was a bunch of things we definitely struggled with and tried multiple different versions of that didn't work, and there was some frustration there. Um, but there's also it was, we had so much fun working on it. There's also I, I think the the original text is not like compared to some of other Dickens' uh, books. It's 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 not like a perfect story. There's a lot of weird tangents and kind of extracurricular stuff and some like lecherous stuff and just like you know stuff that kind of feels weirdly out of context when you just read the original manuscript and so th there was some editing that had to be done to get the whole thing to to read right yeah and correct me if I'm wrong it was serialized in the newspaper and it was paid per work yeah, yes. that's apparent. Yeah, exactly, exactly yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, at some point, and so and sometimes that's more apparent than other. You know, some weeks you might have needed more money than other. <laughs> <Right. days>. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And like at some point, you just make the transition from like fan to like technician. You know, like you're just you go from being so worshipful of these sources to just being like, okay, well, how do you get this car running? Like, how do you get this thing up on its yep. feet? What do you think, Leland? Yeah. Hannah. I should save this one for the interview, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, you can do it twice. So look at, looking at this from the other angle, what made this a project that was a good fit for digital and for the originals program? Because, you know, you're working with an older book, uh, an unfinished book, a classic cartoonist. The first thing you think of might not be digital for it. So, so Hannah's question was, what made this perfect for the uh, Comicsology originals program? And for presenting in a digital format. Well, I, I was approached one night by Harvey's ghost, and uh, he said, Simon & Schuster doesn't want me, what should I do? And I said, let's Here's take this to Comixology. The <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the real honest answer is, why not Hannah? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, this is uh, an age when a lot of people are reading digital comics. I'm old school myself. I prefer to hold it in my hand. But there's no reason it can't be both. And so this is the way it's going to debut. And I don't think uh, Harvey would have had any problem with that. I think he took advantage of anything he could that was cutting edge in his era and set the pace off in his era. So I don't see any conflict at all. I also think for a book that's meant to speak to kind of a mass audience, it's really wonderful to be able to sell it so affordably that it's like three dollars for this hundred and twenty some page graphic novel um, which you would never be able to do in a print format um, but yeah there are a lot of challenges I mean uh, Gideon and I, I think both are sort of print first people generally but like learned a lot about like digital storytelling and how to present things on, on different devices and stuff so it was a real learning process for, for both of us but it was, it was super interesting Anything else from the audience? Yeah, sorry, is there, are there any guided view like uh, things in there? Like those little, it's like some of the books on Comicsology have some really cool guided view tricks in them that. It, it's not a, it's not a guided view native book, yeah. but it is. Uh, we definitely had some rules of the road to make sure that it worked very well in guided view, 
and uh, and we did go back and forth on uh, on a couple of scenes uh, for that. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of conversation about how to make it work best in those like multiple formats and presentations, um, and I think it reads really beautifully in, in guided view. Yeah, I agree, and it's something for. As, as everybody mentioned, for a bunch of people who are coming from doing primarily print uh, first projects to do something with the guide view was, was a good uh, learning curve to, to work through, but I think it ultimately is pretty pretty good in that final form. And Gideon's art just pops on a, on a really high-res iPad screen. It really, yeah. the colors yeah. are nuts. Yeah. That's well, one of the great things about guided view is like, it, makes you look at every panel one by one, where you don't always do that when you read a comic. You kind of look at, the, you, yeah. read, you read them sort of in a flow, but you don't stop on each panel. And for me, coming from an illustration background and trying to make every panel, uh, you know, be, stand on its own, you know, uh, illustration-wise in, in terms of the, the color and the line work and everything, guided view is kind of satisfying in that way because you get to see each panel as its own picture. And so even though that format uh, is uh, you know, not something I was familiar with before, uh, it's kind of gratifying to look at it that way. <laughs> and creating it digitally and then reading it digitally it translates well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was that? Was uh, well, I was, it, I was prompting him is what I was trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> Take the prompt, uh, run with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> you mean in terms of like doing the drawing, like the working digitally to begin with? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I've been working uh, digitally uh, since I started doing comics about five years ago, but I try to make them look as undigital as possible. Um, but working working that way provides a lot of flexibility, and uh, you know, then you you don't have that. Uh, because that's the way that people are going to read it, um, there's no lost in translation thing there. I mean, it's been that way from the beginning, right from the moment I started sketching. So I mean, the, the color palette for digital work, too, is slightly greater than a straight C1K, than a print palette, right? Did you exploit that? It felt like you did, but I wasn't positive. That was something I was mm -hmm. curious about. Um, no, I mean, I think, if anything, I was trying to keep everything looking uh, as analog as possible and uh, even antiqued a little bit. In the early chapters, uh, all the color has uh, a couple of sort of antiquing layers laid over it, but as, as the book went along, I kind of started getting rid of those because it was just too much to keep track of and I realized I was, I was overthinking it. And I think I started working that palette just into the color work itself. Um, but, you know, I was trying to go for a watercolor look and avoid anything that looked specifically digital. Yeah. Um, uh, no, it, it's got a lot of really subtle color. That's what I think comes through when you're looking at it on a really high-res screen. It's, it's gorgeous. And I think uh, some of that probably, if, if this was going print first, there probably would have been notes coming back from me going, some of this is going to get lost. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's really, really okay. strong. And uh, Can you zoom in? Yeah, I was wondering that too. You really drew those mountains. Yeah, those are nice. That's the map Okay. to call out one. Do you have that one you were on with Scrooge's face? It's uh, it's the one right above it. I can see the thumbnail. No, no. The, the page on the side. Oh, the previous slide? Yeah. yeah. Pacing was really interesting too. I felt like it bopped along really well, and that was something. Do you feel like it was Kurtzman that you were that set that, or how much did you have to shift your natural pacing in order to adopt? Or I, it happened pretty naturally. I mean, Kurtzman's pacing is amazing, uh, so that 
you know, that part took care of itself. Uh, again, I think, you know, we had to take some of the scenes that are a little more static and where his writing goes off on some tangents and really kind of cut those back a little bit. There's like a whole dance sequence um, and a whole uh, Christmas party sequence where they're playing parlor games and stuff. And it was like, we, those are important to the story. They show what Christmas is supposed to be about. They needed to be there. Um, but, uh, you know, you're right. Like the pacing of them and how much of them we were going to show was like a, a, a big... Uh, yeah, it slowed it down it. oddly. Like things getting frenetic slowed down the storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that you know, really, the storytelling just happened kind of naturally. Um, we did. Um, I guess, Josh, would you say like that? Um, maybe chapter four, we were like most dr more drastic in terms of like really compressing things that were in the that were in the book. Yeah, I would say, I, I, I do think like as, as the book moved along, we got tighter about like how we handle stuff. Because I do, I, 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 part of me wonders if, if maybe uh, some of Harvey's initial vision that we might have steered away from was that he might have wanted like kids to be able to read this book and really say, I've read A Christmas Carol, I've, like all the text is like in it. there. Because uh -huh. yeah. um, when he adapted it, it was like paragraph by paragraph. And he's Harvey Kurtzman, so he can make that work somehow, um, but it's not the really the best way to adapt a work of prose to like really try to say, okay, well the next sentence is this, what drawing it captures that. Um, so definitely, especially with your help, Shannon, there were whole pages, I think, that we had in our initial rough. So you were like, you know, why do you have that page? It's pointless. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think just, I mean, I, I do think it's important to, I mean, part of what comics are for is to tell stories in the most minimal Way, way they possibly can, um, and that's what Kurtzman was was so good at throughout throughout his career, um, and so yeah, we we tried to, and I, I think I mean Gideon is uh, his his own comics that, that he makes are amazingly well paced. It's like one of Gideon's great talents, and I think it fits in with with, with Kurtzman's voice. Um, so we really tried to focus on making the thing move as as fast as possible. Dennis, what do you think? I mean, you've read. Kurtzman's adaptation of stuff. I mean, there's something that I thought was really interesting or weird or I don't know about him taking Christmas Carol, which which is this long kind of rambling piece, and then Kurtzman, who's like this staccato minimalist. Yeah, it does seem like an unlikely pairing. I think the way we're respectful of Harvey, he was respectful of Dickens, because when he was growing up, that was one of the classics that meant a lot to him. And I, I think he was a little trepidatious about tampering with it too much initially. And I'm curious myself, I saw how he started out, like Josh described, paragraph for paragraph. I wonder if that would have changed had he gone further, because these were the presentation pages Perhaps he thought he was going to a house like Simon and Schuster. It needed to be as literate as possible. That's my hunch, but we'll never know. Yeah, it felt like almost like he was trying to find some cross between a prose book and a comic. Right. So the the, the, the woman who is the editor at Simon and Schuster might have taken it more seriously and not wandered off on her young assistant, who was apparently clueless as to the concept. Yeah, I wonder if he wanted like students to be reading it in schools and stuff like that, and they thought you need Dickens' words in there to... I suspect so. Um, remember, an interesting footnote is Harvey Kurtzman's very first professional assignment was he worked at Classics Illustrated on Moby Dick. If you look at that issue of Moby Dick, you can't see much Harvey Kurtzman in, but he was doing some rudimentary inking. He was uh, not long out of high school when he did that. So um, he cited uh, those attempts, even though they're often very crude. And Crime Does Not Pay, interestingly enough, was another one that influenced him and, uh, and people like Will Eisner in his formative years. So some of these questions, you know, we, we can only speculate. Uh, I wish I and I wish people who had interviewed Harvey had asked the, more about this, but we didn't know it existed. Uh, 
How was it found? Yeah, I was just going to say. It was, uh, it was no, in his attic. I was going to say, how was it found? <laughs> the, uh, the pages were in his attic. Um, Harvey tended to be a pack rat. Um, and they were um, wrapped up in uh, brown butcher paper, tape over them. They hadn't probably been opened since 1962 when he took them to uh, Saturday Evening Post of all places. And um, so I was helping him sort things in the attic and things that, uh, so many things that I wish I had asked more questions about at the time. But he gave me the brief rundown on it, and it was just one of many things we were going through. It wasn't until later that I really looked at it closely. Harvey was also ill at this time. He had Parkinson's disease. It wasn't easy for him to talk and articulate you know anything about Parkinson's so uh, so yeah I, I, I wish in retrospect you know I'd even uh, given him written questions and he had taken the time and written down the answers but it didn't happen well I think we're at time and uh, really appreciate everyone on the panel and uh, the hard work in this book and I uh, appreciate everyone coming out for the panel and uh, be back at uh, comicsology.com November 8th and you can uh, experience uh, Marley's Ghost for yourself. Thank you. Thank you.